Good morning, church. Our scripture reading for today is Malachi 2. Therefore, this decree is for you, priests. If you don't listen, and if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you, and I will curse your blessings. In fact, I have already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. Look, I am going to rebuke your descendants, and I will spread animal waste over your faces, the waste from your festival sacrifices, and you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I sent you this decree, so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of armies. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave th these to him. It called for reverence, and he revered me, and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and integrity, and turned away many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should desire instruction from his mouth, because he is the messenger of the Lord of armies. You, on the other hand, have turned from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have violated the covenant of Levi says the Lord of armies. So I, in turn, have made you despised and humiliated before all the people, because you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in your instruction. Don't all of us have one Father? Didn't one God create us? Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our ancestors? Judah has acted treacherously, and a detestable act has been done in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves, and he has married the daughter of a foreign, foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, whoever he may be, even if he presents an offering to the Lord of armies. This is another thing you do. You are covering the Lord's altar with tears with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. And you ask, why? Because even though the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, you have acted treacherously against her. She was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Didn't God make them one and give them a portion of spirit? What is the one seeking? Godly offspring? So watch yourselves carefully, so that no one acts treacherously against the wife of his youth. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord of God, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of armies. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you ask, how have we wearied him? When you say, Everyone who does what is evil is good in the Lord's sight, and he is delighted with them. Or else, where is the God of justice? This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City. As an elder and pastor, this morning I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. This morning we look at uh, week two or part two in our series in the book of Malachi. Last week we looked at the whole first chapter of Malachi, written about 400 years before Christ, but still very relevant to us in the 21st century. We came to understand that God is speaking to the Israelites through Malachi. The Israelites are God's chosen people, and we form part of the chosen people because of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us and adopts us into his family. In chapter 1, we see two claims that God makes. The first claim is that God loves his people. The second claim is that God is deserving of honor. God proves those claims to be true. So if you want to know more about that, you're welcome to listen to that episode on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. So we're in chapter 2 this morning. It is a long chapter, but we're going to make, it, we're going to make, make our way through it uh, quickly. So both chapter 1 and chapter 2 can be themed exposing Israel's corruption. We, we will see this morning corruption in leadership and corruption in relationships. Giotto di, di, di Bondone is an Italian painter whose most famous artwork is called The Kiss of Judas. In the painting, Judas is identified with a golden cloak and Jesus is identified by a golden halo. 
Judas embraces Jesus while simultaneously betraying him. Jesus, in contrast, appears calm and resigned, accepting his fate with grace and dignity. The other disciples react with shock and dismay, their faces twisted in anguish as they witness the betrayal unfolding before them, and you can see the soldiers around the scene seemingly quite chaotic. So the kiss of Judas is the name of this painting. The kiss of Judas is a a powerful portrayal of betrayal, capturing the moment of profound betrayal and treachery in the Bible narrative. Giotto's masterful use of color, composition, and emotion conveys the complex dynamics of trust, loyalty, and betrayal, inviting people to contemplate the human capacity for deception and disloyalty. We will see themes of deception and relational faithlessness in Malachi 2. These themes are part of a general corruption that takes place among the Israelites, and in truth, we can also identify with these similar themes. If there was one word that I would get rid of with all its brokenness, with all its destruction and all its effects, it would be faithlessness. We see faithlessness in deception and corruption as well. People who forget the promises of God. We just saw them in verse 1, but still disobey or choose idols and disloyalty. So we saw those promises of God, but the Israelites still choose disloyalty and idols. We will see Malachi through God speaking to priests this morning, contrasting priests that fail their function and what priests should look like. We'll ask ourselves what is priest as well before we get started. And we'll also look at three forms of relational dysfunction uh, quickly at the end of the chapter. So three points this morning. Who are the priests? The message to the priests and faithlessness in relationships. Who are the priests? The message to the priests? Faithlessness in relationships. Let's pray as we get into God's word. Lord, we thank you that this morning that we can meet and gather as your people to praise and honor you, spend time in in worship and, and beholding your beauty, beholding you, Lord God. We thank you that the Holy Spirit would move among us and continue to help us to encounter you. We thank you for spaces of fellowship where we can get to know one another and continue to deepen our relationship For our relationship is based on the death and resurrection of Jesus, and that's what brings us together. I thank you that we can open your word at this time, and that your word is true, that your word is timeless, that your word is important, and I pray that you would remove any distractions from us to enable us to hear your word. This morning there may be things that may be challenging to hear, so I pray that by your spirit that you would not bring confusion, not bring pain, but that you would redeem where there's been pain or confusion. I pray that you'd be at work by your spirit this morning. Speak through my vocal cords those things that you'd want your people to know, to say, and to do, and may the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. So Malachi starts with the words, therefore. Therefore is a conjunctive adverb. So we do a bit of English in the mornings as well. So an adverb qualifies an adjective, and a conjunction joins the two things. So therefore, joins two ideas, and it qualifies the second idea using the first one. So because God loves his people, that's what we saw in chapter 1, because God loves his people, because he deserves all honor, because the Lord is great, all of this from verse 1, therefore what is to come next is important. Then listen to this priest, and that's what we see as we start in verse 1 of chapter 2. Listen to this priest. Therefore, this decree is for you, priest. If you don't listen, and if you don't take it to heart to honor my name, says the Lord of armies, I will send a curse among you, and I will curse your blessings. In fact, I've already begun to curse them because you are not taking it to heart. So first point, who are the priests? How does this relate to us, and why should we be listening to this this morning? Priests in the Old Testament had a specific role and specific function. A role being a part that they play and function being the actions that they perform within that part. So Deuteronomy 33 verse 10 says, They will teach your ordinances to Jacob and your instruction to Israel. They will set incense before you and hold burnt offerings on your altar. 
So that verse 10 speaks a lot about the role and the function of the priest. The priests in the Old Testament play the role as intermediary between God and his people. As intermediaries or advocates, they had functions to lead and perform part of people's forgiveness of sins carried out through sacrifices. Jesus Christ in the New Testament takes over that role. He is the final and complete sacrifice for our sins. Jesus breaks down the barrier between us and God, giving us direct access to God. After his death and resurrection, Jesus sits at the right hand of God, advocating for us as he lived and experienced all that we do and intercedes for us. Therefore, Christ is the only one who has the role of priest, as the one who brings a sacrifice on our behalf, the final and complete sacrifice for the atonement of our sins. Hebrews 9, verse 11 to 12 says, But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, in the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So through that redemption, Christ becomes the final sacrifice and takes the role, finally, of the high priest. And a few verses later, verse 15 says, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called might receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. In the traditional sense of what a priest did in the Old Testament, only Jesus has that role now. Another function of priests we see in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Peter, speaking to the Jews, those who belong to God, calls the Jews a holy priesthood and royal nation. So Peter in 1 Peter 2 is reminding the Jews about their chosenness. I'm not sure if that is a word, but let's coin that as a word for now. Their, their, their chosenness. He speaks about their chosenness to proclaim the mercies and excellencies of God. 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we are part of God's chosen people. We saw that last week. We are his royal priesthood. In function, we ought to proclaim Christ and tell everyone about Jesus. Tell everyone that God loves his people. Tell everyone that God is deserving of honor. And tell everyone that God is great. That is our role as part of the royal priesthood. So everyone who is a Christian is part of the holy nation and the royal priesthood. In function, we know these people as people who proclaim Christ, who proclaim the praises of the one who has called them into the marvelous light. We see that in Peter. In this context, Malachi is speaking about priests and the function of teacher. So people who have been called by God to teach and to lead specifically. So those who are what we call in the office of teacher within a particular space. So we are all part of the royal priesthood. We are all part of those who should proclaim Christ crucified. There are no longer priests in this day and age because Christ is the final priest who stands before God atoning for us. But Malachi now is speaking about those who are in the office, the, the leaders who, are, who God has called in particular to teach. So we call these people pastors or shepherds. So they're no longer priests in their role. Christ has taken that. So we will see this morning as we look at the nine verses. Um, and as we look at that, whenever we mention priest, remember function and not role. I think the, no, the next most important question is why should we be teaching a message about pastors, about teachers, and why should this message be important to you? I think this message is important for three reasons. Pastors have a calling that is weighty. The pastors have a calling, that, and the, for the, the calling is the reason why we should pray for, encourage, love, and support pastors. Their calling is to lead and to teach and to equip people that God has put in their, in their care. We also need to be able to identify pastors. We will learn the signs of the behaviors and actions of a pastor this morning. We need to also be able to hold pastors accountable. To do that, we need to know the standards on which we need to hold them accountable. And that's why this morning, we're going to spend a few moments looking at, at the message to the priests, the message to the pastors. So just a quick side road. We spoke about priests and the role and the, and the function, that we are now speaking about function. Priests also provided blessings to the people 
in the old traditional sense of peace. They, pro- they would preside over and look after people. In, in verse 8, we see the mention of the covenant of Levi. So we need to understand that before we can put into context what is to come about priests. So Levi was the third son of Leah and Jacob. Levi became the father of the Levite's tribe. From the tribe of Levi came other prominent people and high priests. So brothers Moses and Aaron came from that. Moses was a prophet and Aaron was the first high priest from that uh, tribe, as well as his sons. So the sons of Aaron were also high priests. So Aaron is a mediator between God and the Israelites as the first high priest. He's the, he's the only one who's able to enter the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was built uh, and the people were not allowed to enter the tabernacle. But the high priest would enter on behalf of the people to bring the sacrifices and offer sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. So all priests came from the tribe of Levi, and that is why there's a mention about the covenant of Levi. But not everyone from the tribe of Levi was a, was a high priest. But all priests traditionally came from the tribe of Levi. This is part of God's covenant with that tribe. The priests also served as judges and teachers of the law. So God held priests to a high standard. Priests who entered the temple would be judged if they didn't obey and follow God's law. The first examples were the two sons of Aaron who were judged and died as they entered the temple. The role of priests was to teach, or the function of priests was to teach, was to perform sacrifices and role on behalf of the people and was to bless the people. So Numbers 6 has a famous priestly prayer that we often speak or we often say, a prayer that God gives to Moses to tell to Aaron and Aaron to deliver to the people as part of a blessing upon the people, which says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Then turn his face upon you and give you peace. So that's part of the blessing that the, that the high priest or the priest would be able to give unto the people to bring blessing to the people. So let's get into what God has to say uh, to the pastors. So our second point. In verses 2 8 and 9, we see some failures or corruption of the priests. In verses 5, 6, and 7, we see the nature of faithful priests. So let's look at the first mention of the faithlessness from the priests. In verse 2, we see the words, listen and take to heart, being one of the failures of the priests. What are, the, what are priests to listen to? What are these pastors to listen to? Firstly, priests ought to listen to God and be led by God and obey God. We see this throughout chapter 2. Honor my name, in verse 2. Stand stand in awe of my name, verse 6. Walk with me, verse 6. Guard the word of truth and teach people, verse 7. So priests in Malachi knew the law. However, they too performed sacrifices of unfit and unworthy animals that were brought by the people. We see this in chapter 1. The priests were swayed by a changing culture and never stood firm to the word or the voice of God to the calling of God. This should be and sound familiar. We live in an age where pastors seek glory for themselves, swayed by fleshly desires, and lead or are led astray. It doesn't take long to hear stories about pastors who make people perform acts of harm to themselves in the name of God, to drink or to eat unnatural things. It doesn't take long to hear stories about pastors who abuse women and children in church. We have pastors who teach what is not from the Bible or rather avoid the Bible and speak what is in their head, claiming it to be the word of God, but void of any truth. So the the voice of God is clear if you open the Bible and read it. This is how God speaks. God speaks through his word. Listening to him is to know his word and to know what he desires. Walking with God is hearing from him through the Bible. Speaking to him and discerning the word of God and the application of it to you as the individual or as a priest. In this day and age, we have more churches, but not all Bible believing and Bible teaching. This means that's the first failure of some priests in that they don't listen to the word of God. They don't listen to God and they don't honor God. Some have turned away from God. You can't speak or teach faithfully if you can't hear the word of God, if you can't listen to him. That's the first failure. Second failure in verse 2 is not honoring God. So honor means regard or treat with respect. Are the actions of the pastor showing honor to God? Is their lives, their actions and words a compass that points to God? Or are they seeking honor and praise from men? Are they making the name of the Lord great or more focused on making their name great? 
Honoring God is putting God first, is living to elevate God in both actions and in words. Verse 8, we see another failure of pastors, pastors who have turned away and lead their people away from God. They have turned away because they don't hear or listen to the word of God. They desire to be honored rather than honoring God. We see pastors who elevate their own selves before God, that have their people worship them instead of God. Pastors who take the glory of God while seeking affirmation from men and not from God. The last failure that we see is not keeping the ways of God in verse 9 and showing a bias in their teaching. In this day and age, we see many pastors who don't keep the ways of God, who lead their people astray, who don't teach Christ crucified, but teach watered-down messages that bring them popularity and money. Here's the warning to pastors who don't hear the failures and cling to Jesus with all faithfulness and heart. Here's the warning. Look, I'm going to rebuke your descendants, and I will spread animal waste over your faces, the waste from your festival sacrifices, and you'll be taken away with it. I'm going to rebuke your descendants, similar to what God says in Hosea, verse 4, 6 to 8. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from serving as my priest, since you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your sons. If priests don't listen and honor God in their heart by their actions, by their love, and desire to see God's people honor and praise God, desire that the people would know God, then they reject the knowledge of God as priests, and God will reject them. That's the warning. There is a mention of descendants also being rebuked. This in context is in relation to the tribe of Levi. This tribe had priests and for generations and generations in that lineage there would be more priests. So the actions of a priest that would not listen and defile the calling would fall to the lineage of all those priests within the tribe of Levi. Other priests after them would be affected and the, and the, and the hands of the failure of the priests before them. Other translations use the word seed. So the works of the hands of the pastors who are faithless and corrupt would destroy the work of their hands, seeds as they plant. So think monetary, think planting, think agriculture in that day and age, even in today's space, and teaching or faithlessness. And biological offspring, which is likely included in that theme. So also biological offspring, what the, what the, what the preachers of the Lord teach, what they do with their hands would be cursed. So think of a modern-day church and structure. If the pastor does not listen and honor God, their rebuke would affect those who are part of the church when God disciplines that pastor. Their actions would also be on the lineage of the leaders that they lead and pastors who are being taught and disciples under them. So the curse of the pastor would also fall upon those whom he led, those from the tribe and the family that he has. If you remember the priestly blessing which Moses gave to Aaron to bless the people, the pastor who is cursed will not bless his people, but rather be a curse unto his people. This is why we need to know this. This is why we need to know what the call of the pastor is, so that we can see and hold pastors accountable. You should hold Rain and myself accountable, and all leaders of the church accountable. Accountable to listening to God, to honoring God, and faithfulness in teaching and living. So our desire is that you would hold us accountable, and that's why we would teach a message like this. So the warning says the pastors will be rejected. They will also have animal waste on their faces. So during the sacrifice in the temple, some parts of the animal would be seen as unfit to be part of the sacrifice. They would be removed, they would be cut off, and they'd be discarded, and they'd be removed from the temple so that the offering could still take place. So then the animal would be burned. Uh, We don't have time to go into more detail about about sacrifices, but the animal would be burned, but some of the parts of the animal would be removed and taken out of the the temple. So this would be those parts that are cut off and removed, smeared on the faces of the pastors as a sign of rejection and humiliation, and then being cast out of the temple. That's what this, this verse says. Same as what is impure and cut and thrown, those pastors who do not hear and honor the name of God, that lead their people astray, will be cut off, smeared with feces in the sense of humiliation and rejection and cut off and thrown out of the temple. That is the warning Malachi gives, a warning for all pastors, and the warning that you should know so that you can know and hold your pastors accountable. So we live in a, in a broken and fallen world because of sin. 
I would not want anyone listening to this message to experience, uh, and someone who's experienced hypocrisy and faithful, faith, faithlessness of pastors to turn away from God and miss that God is a God who judges and redeems. So God hates pastors who seek honor for themselves, who lead others astray, who teach empty words. God will deal with them and judge them. But I believe that God wants his people to be able to discern and know a good shepherd from a bad one. God also wants his, his royal priesthood, you, all of us, all of us who have put their faith and trust in him, to listen to him and honor him and walk with him in order that we would know what his word and his desires are, in order that we can know when we're being deceived and when the curse of the faithless pastors may fall upon us. So this is important for you to know, fam to see the faithlessness of pastors and to be able to discern their corruption and deception, to know the pastors if they're faithful or faithless. Let's look at what pastors should be in verses 5, 6, and 7. Verse 5, we see that a pastor should revere and stand in awe of God. Revere meaning to have deep respect and admiration. A pastor should have a deep respect for God, for the majesty, for the power, for the greatness of God. This in practice is a pastor who desires to see much made of God, for honor to go to God instead of themselves, a pastor who knows God as friend but respects and addresses God as father, a pastor who desires to see God magnified above all things and for the people to know the greatness of God. Verse 5, my covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave these to him, and it, and it called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. So a big part of life and peace a big part is covenant, a big part is life, a big part is peace. God calls and elects pastors to lead his people. He is in covenant with them, gives them what they need for ministry. The pastor's response to God's calling in covenant is to revere and stand in awe of God. You should be able to see a pastor in calling and authority, peace and sentness. Mama Antoinette, a member of our church, during a vision casting um, space, asked this question. Uh, to both myself and to Reino, how does your life outside of a Sunday reflect your God-given gifting? That's a phenomenal question. Um, so I'm a shepherd uh, teacher. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, not, not everyone would know that. Uh, God called me to himself um, in my final year of metric. And in my first year of varsity, all I did was work with God. Um, this is not a work of myself coming from a family that is not a Bible-believing family. In my second year, I stood in a place of a Bible study leader who couldn't attend, but I believed that I would be able, or they believed that I would be able to teach um, and be able to lead, and the church's leadership attended that session. Um, the first time they did, and I didn't notice them, because my role there was to teach. Um, Seeing me, they took me under their wing, and we did lots of teaching, lots of preaching. I preached a lot in orphanages, helped to build content for, the, for them in teaching. As someone young in their faith, but that was because the call of God was on my life and not my call on my life. Um, I started a Christian organization on campus with a group of friends to host spaces to evangelize. At times, I had two Bible studies a week that I was leading. Um, I did study and I did pass. That's important to mention. <laughs> I believe I still hold some records at school, but that's God's faithfulness, not mine. I met my wife in church. I was leading Bible study. She, coming from Bible college, she believed that she met someone who could teach and teach her faithfully. And that's where we met, and that's how we got married eventually. This isn't me leading, but this is God leading. This was all God. He was the one who leads and guides, who enables me to serve him in the gifting that he has given me. Even in my vocation, I lead teams, I teach, I equip. I desire to see people built up and flourishing. I build networks and structures. So even my vocation reflects my nature as someone who would be standing before you. I desire to see people built up and flourishing. I protect the people the same as my calling as shepherd and teacher. I give all glory to God. I can't be good at my job in and of myself. It's only through God. I can't be a good shepherd without him. If I don't listen to the Holy Spirit leading and guiding me, I can't shepherd his people. I can't love his people, I can't teach. We lived with a couple for a year because we believed that it was what God would have us, would have us do uh, to love, serve, and to care for them. And God did amazing things through their lives. Again, it wasn't us. It was us, my wife and I, 
heeding to the call that God would place before us. I don't like to be seen. I wrestled with whether I should add this. Um, I'm still not sure if I should have added, so I'm still working through it in my head. Um, I'm not perfect. I still fail and fall, but I do desire to see God glorified, God honored, and faithful men and women living in honor of God. This is a desire that both Reino and myself share. You see a pastor in their respect and admiration for the majesty, mercy, and wonder of God. Verse 6 also tells us how to see a pastor. A pastor is someone who guards the word of God and lives it out, speaks the truth. Someone who spends time with God. We see the words used, walks with God. We also see the words turn many from iniquity. So there's fruit, but there's action in walking with God. People listen to the pastor and they grow in knowledge of God and grow in honor and reverence to God. For he is just a messenger from God. He is called to be God, to be a herald and to share the truth. So there's some contrast that we see between the failures, the faithfulness, and the faithlessness of the pastors. So verse 2, we have the pastor who doesn't honor God's name, and the pastor who stands in awe and reverence of God's name in verse 5 as two contrasts. In verse 8, we see the pastor who leads people astray and causes them to stumble, and in verse 6, we see or have the pastor who produces fruit and helps people turn from their iniquity. That's another contrast. In verse 9, we see the failure of the priest who doesn't honor God and the faithlessness of the pastor. And in verse 7, we see the lips of the priest which should guard knowledge and be a messenger to that message. Fam, what is important is to be able to see and hold pastors accountable. What is important is to be able to pray for your pastors, to encourage them to love and to support your pastors, regardless of which church you come from. And that's why we need to teach, and we teach all of the Bible Okay, let's look at faithlessness in relationships. Our last point, in verses 10 to 16, there are three main types of relationships. We will try to cover these as faithfully as possible this morning and as quickly as possible. So there are three common relationships. There are three three common failures within relationships. Common relationships, that's the first one, marrying an unbeliever and divorce. Failure in common relationships, marrying an unbeliever, and divorce. So verse 10, we see the first relationship. We see people acting treacherously against one another. Treacherously meaning deceiving or behaving badly or disingenuously to someone who trusts you. There's also a mention of profaning the covenant of the ancestors. The word faithless is seen in all three of the relationships that we see in verses 10 to 16. The same word used for treacherously is the same word as faithless. So God is highlighting faithlessness among the Israelites. God sets the reason and motivation to be faithful in highlighting faithlessness. So don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? If we're faithless to one another, are we not faithless to God our father? I have two daughters. Whenever one of them acts harshly or faithless to one another, I stop them to talk about it. It's because it's not only faithless to the one but it feels so much like faithless to me. It hurts me also. It saddens me also. As if they were directing their faithlessness to me. So verse 10 also mentions the covenant of our ancestors. This is a covenant between the, the covenant God has with Abraham. We spoke about this last week. Through the covenant of Abraham, we're adopted into one family through the death and resurrection of Jesus. We disrespect the covenant between God and his people if we're not faithful to one another. What does that look like for us today? Looks like not breaking someone's trust, not lying or acting in bad faith, not saying one thing and doing another. Think about the kiss of Judas, but regularly keeping commitment and trust. We will see more expression of this general faithlessness in the two other relationships. So the second relationship, verses 11 and 12, we see God through the prophet Malachi speaking about marriage to unbelievers. The section forms part of a claim and dispute type of poetry that we saw in chapter 1. So where God lays a claim, the people respond and God ends with the last word. So the third and last claim in the theme of God exposing Israel's corruption is Israel turning away from God and from their wives with a response, how? So marrying of someone who is an unbeliever is turning away from God. That is what Malachi 
says through the words of God. In context, the Israelites were marrying women who believed in other gods. So just a quick side road, there's a specific mention of men in Malachi marrying women from other tribes and who, who believed and worshipped other gods. In other passages in this Bible, this command is to be unevenly yoked for both men and women. In this passage, this is because of the patriarchal nature of the time in which Malachi was in. The society that will be led by men would carry the culture and the lineage of the tribe. And that is why he speaks directly to men to not marry outside of the tribe of Judah. But this applies to men and women, to not marry outside of the belief and love of God. So having men marry outside of the tribe of Judah would water down and bring other, bring other gods into the culture of the Israelites. And that's why he speaks directly to the men, to not bring other cultures or other practices into the tribe of Israel. Therefore, this warning is for men and for women to not be unevenly yoked. To claim to love God with all your heart then willfully marry someone who rejects God is a rejection of God. God uses harsher words in verse 12 to describe this. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob the man who does this, whoever he may be, even if he presents an offering to the Lord of armies. That's, those are harsh words. The, the harsh word would be something like disgust or de detestation to marry someone who is not a believer. If you are a believer, that's the form of rejection that is spoken about here. So just another quick side road. The passage is quite clear. What the passage is not saying is that an unbeliever can't be converted. It's not saying that. It is saying if you marry someone who is an unbeliever, their beliefs and cultural practices and expressions can cause you conflict in your relationship with God. And therefore, it may harden your heart. And that is what God was calling against, the hardening of the heart to him because of other practices coming into the tribe. So passage is clear. Passage is not saying get a divorce if you are married to an unbeliever. It's not saying that either. So read 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12 to 13. We can't spend more time if you want to know a bit more about that. The passage is not saying get a divorce if you are married to an unbeliever. If you're married to and become an unbeliever, if you're married to an unbeliever, if you are a believer and your partner doesn't believe, then you need to proclaim Christ in your marriage and pray for your marriage. There are specific grounds for divorce and your partner being an unbeliever isn't necessarily one. I can't spend more time on that now. The passage is saying, if you're still able to choose marriage, if you're still able to marry someone, make sure it's a believer if you're a believer. For if they're not it will cause conflict in your relationship with God. So third dysfunction of faithful, faithlessness in the relationship is seen in verse 13 to 16. And it, and it can be captioned as, I hate divorce, says the Lord. God hates divorce. So the, the, reason, the reasons why God hates divorce are listed here. God hates divorce because it breaks the covenant. Verse 13, she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. So this covenant is between man and woman who become one before God. Before God, we see in verses 14, the Lord has been a witness between you and your wife of your youth. This covenant also portrays the covenant between God and his church. He is the God of Israel. We see this in verse 16. God is in covenant with Israel. Israel is his bride. We are part of God's chosen people. We therefore form the church, which is God's bride. If God would not hate divorce, he would be fine he would be fine with people not seeing the majesty, the sovereignty and faithfulness in his covenant with the church. But God wants people to see the majesty, the sovereignty and the faithfulness in his covenant with his church. And that's why he hates the verse. In the New Testament, the Bible does, not, does give two grounds for divorce, not necessarily in this passage, which is sexual immorality and abandonment. You can see that in Matthew and 1 Corinthians 7. We don't have time to go through that now. But if you do need to speak or want to speak about that, you're welcome to speak to me about it after the service. So even in the midst of, of these, the desire from pastors and leaders is first to seek reconciliation where possible because God hates divorce. However, outside of reconciliation and standing firm in sexual immorality or abandonment, there is ability of one to get divorced. Uh, so let's look at verse 17 as we close. So in closing, verse 17 lands with a warning. A warning to the Israelites and a warning to us. There are some who weary the Lord, who don't listen to continue to ignore and reject God. 
those who test the Lord by doing evil and calling it good. Doing evil and hiding behind God and believing God is delighted. Think about the kiss of Judas again. In the context of the Israelites, they would ask, where is God's justice? Chapter 3 and 4 speaks in detail about Jesus coming. So yes, he is coming, and when he comes, he will judge. If you know and love the Lord, then his coming brings joy. You will be united with him. You will reign with him. There's a song by Fatfish called There's a Day. The words say, the trumpet sounds and the dead will be raised by his power never to perish again. Once only flesh, now closed with immortality. Death has now been swallowed up in victory. We will meet him in the air and there we will be like him for we will see him as he is. Then all hurt and pain will cease and we'll be with him forever and in his glory we will live. This will be a day of victory for those who listen and honor God. For those who are the royal priesthood. Those who proclaim his word and live a life that reflects Christ crucified. For those who don't know him, those who don't hear or listen to his voice, those that reject him, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There will be fear and ultimate affirmation that God is Lord, but an eternity of separation. We should see from chapter 1 and 2 that the Israelites didn't always remember the love of God. The Israelites didn't, did not obey God. They willfully made choices that did not honor God. There's a warning for them to turn back and not face the wrath and punishment of God. We too should reflect on and see if there are places in our lives where we don't obey and honor God, and we should turn back. God is faithful even when we are faithless. His promise still stands and he will never fail us. He desires for us to honor him, to listen to him, to know him, to, turn, to return to him if we have wandered from the way. Here's a quote from Tim Keller as we, as we close. The gospel... The gospel of justifying faith means that while Christians are in themselves still sinful and sinning, yet in Christ, in God's sight, they are accepted and righteous. So we can say that we are more wicked than we ever dared believe, but more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hoped at the very same time. This creates a radical new dynamic for personal growth. It means that the more you see your own flaws and sins, the more precious, electrifying, and amazing God's grace appears to you. But on the other hand, the more aware you are of God's grace and acceptance in Christ, the more able you are to drop your denials and self-defenses and admit the true dimensions and character of your sin. This morning, as we reflect on chapter 1 and chapter 2, we should see the gospel in it. We should see fallen and broken people that can't do good in and of themselves, redeemed by the high priest, Jesus Christ who redeems us and calls us back to himself, who desires to have a relationship, a personal relationship with, with us. The hope is that we would see our own flaws and sins and we would run to God's grace because he desires for us to come to him. The hope is that we would drop our self-denials and self-defenses of corruption and faithlessness, that we would run back into the faithful and loving arms of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, um, we come to you this morning thankful of your faithfulness. Thankful that you made a way to reunite us with yourselves, that you loved us, that you chose us, and we saw this in chapter 1 of Malachi, that you chose us, you called us to yourself, and we could do nothing to fix our relationship with you. We ask for forgiveness where we have been faithless. And we know that as we ask for forgiveness, that your arms are open and ready to embrace us. We pray that you would bring a desire for us to continually walk and to know you, that we would listen to you, and listening comes from reading your word, that we would walk with you, which means listening and speaking and meditating and delighting and finding joy in you. Would you build up a desire and hunger for that in our lives? May we reflect Christ in the way we live. May we honor you. May we listen to you. May we walk with you. May you build up a love in us for you, for only you can do that.
We thank you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.